All right, we are going to get everyone in the room. Welcome to our last in this series this year, but absolutely not the least, Rethinking Work series. Um, new measures of work, mobility, equity, and productivity. We will wait for people to join. We know it's a um, very busy time of year. But um, the topic is very, very current. And we're going to be recording this webinar at the request of everyone else who signed up but is not going to make it to the presentation in person or online. All right, just some, as people are still joining, some um, uh, rules of the road here. I think everyone is familiar with how Zoom conferences work. We would like you to put your questions in the Q&A tab. If there are any um, comments that you want to make to the entire uh, participant room, then you're welcome to use chat. And we will be answering your questions at the end of the presentation. So once again, we are going to give people a little bit of time to join. And I'm seeing some familiar faces here already in the room. Welcome, welcome all. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. Renee, the next one, please. Just very quickly. All right, so those of you who don't know me, Anna Tavis, I'm the Academic Director, um, Human Capital Management Programs. And I've been hosting this series um, for this year, and we are going to continue resume in the fall. However, today is really the one of the most important conversations that we've had for the entirety of this year. And I think it's a really logical conclusion of some of those threads that we picked up on throughout our conversations this uh, academic year. So our guest today is Matt Siegelman, the president of Bur Burning Glass Institute. So Renee, bring us please in the room. Um, so I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Matt to NYU. He is very familiar with our programs. In fact, Matt was one of the inspirations for me to create the uh, Human Capital Analytics and Technology um, program. And he's a frequent guest to our classes as a guest speaker, as well as the materials that um, Burning Glass Institute generates are always a very good um, assignment for any one of our students here in human capital management programs. So Matt, uh, without further ado, we've all read your bio. Um, I just want to say that your pedigree, academic pedigree, is exceptional. Um, Princeton, um, Harvard, McKinsey, workplace, right? Um, you were an, a founder, an entrepreneur, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, if you think about what you're dedicating yourself to these days, is really to open the field of opportunities and make the case for different kinds of career paths and decisions and valuing skills above all of those familiar signs of, you know, what we now know is educational privilege, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's a very interesting career trajectory and very interesting vantage point to look from this entire field of workforce transformation. And on this note, I want to invite you to share with us what you're working on, and then we'll jump back to this conversation at the very end of your presentation. Thank you. Thank well, you. Well, Anna, thank you so much. Um, it's, um, it's, it's wonderful to be together as always, um, and you're far too kind. Um, 
I uh, I think you know what you described is is um, you know I think is is a great um, uh, really a great way to to lead into what I'm hoping to cover today and and that's this we live in a world and in, in, and I think you know we our labor market is one that finds itself increasingly um, rife with inefficiency. Um, we uh, live and work within a, a world where um, we know that um, that talent uh, often is uh, stuck, is unable to rise, um, is uh, kept from opportunity alongside um, yawning skill gaps, um, yawning talent shortages um, that exist. And, and we know that um, the technology and the billions, the tens of billions, the hundreds of billions of dollars that have been spent on technology um, in the world of HR um, have, um, uh, have not seemed to solve this problem. We're at a point in, in, in fact, where we're seeing those kinds of disparities, those inequities, um, those inefficiencies become deeper um, and more enduring um, and, um, and, and more, um, uh, more daunting than before. And so I think that's why the work that um, you're, you've been leading on in driving a real academic study of, of not only of HR, but of HR analytics is so important because it puts front and center um, key challenges, key business challenges, not HR challenges, but business challenges. And it says, how do we bring data to a bear? How do we bring um, insight to bear in identifying new models? And when we do that, um, even though we're, we're approaching that from the perspective of the firm and its need for talent, inherently as we uh, create new scope for of opportunity for people, uh, or, or as we create more effective pipelines for talent rather for companies, Inherently, what we're doing is we're creating new opportunity for people. Um, and so um, you're absolutely right. That's why, you know, I've sort of uh, over the last uh, 18 months or so, um, you know, worked to launch a new nonprofit research center focused on how do we use data to more effectively measure some of the things that we think are most important to solve for? How do we um, bring new models to bear? in ensuring that we can be more effective in finding the talent that we need, in making sure that we can make better um, use of the talent that we have, um, that we can make better investments in that talent, um, and that we can make sure that workers and learners themselves have more opportunity. So um, that sort of ties directly to what I'm hoping to, to talk about today, which is this question of, okay, so we've got these new imperatives. Um, uh, you know, can't find the talent, we're starved for, you know, I think there's a lot of companies that have real sincerity around, um, around building equity in their workforces, um, but don't know how to start. Um, we have, um, in, on the other side, workers who are, who are struggling to move up. Um, and we have employers increasingly with um, you know, kind of looming threat of you to like hearing on a summer evening and you hear the thunder coming, you don't know whether it's going to come, when it's going to come, uh, of recession, um, you're seeing more and more companies start to focus on questions of productivity. And, and, and in fact, that's where I'd like to start is what does that actually mean? So I'm going to share um, my screen um, and hopefully you can, yeah, I think you can now. Um, so I, I want to speak about those specific um, goods that we're trying to solve for productivity, mobility, and equity. And, you know, look, that which gets measured gets managed. How do we measure those values? Um, and what are the kind of ways, what is the implication of that for the work that happens within HR analytics? It's interesting because each of these three things, productivity, mobility, and equity, sounds, um, well, pretty straightforward. Um, and then when you start to unpack them, you realize that each of them is um, deeply challenging to measure. Um, and I think that's part of why there's actually been scant measurement um, in truly effective ways 
um, of these of these values. It's kept companies not only from measuring them, but from benchmarking the performance, from knowing what's good, um, and from understanding how they can affect, invest effectively to move the needle. So let's start with this question of productivity. Um, you know, you know that's sort of sounds like a, a wet uh, a wet blanket for a lot of people. Okay, you know, productivity. Uh, you know, conjures images of of Frederick Taylor and and his days of of management science and and guys in, in white lab coats. Uh, I think they were mostly guys um, with stopwatches um, and and trying to figure out how do we you know how do we do motion studies, time and motion studies, and the like, and 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 try to um, boost um, labor efficiency. Here's why I think it's it's an important place to start. Um, over the last 50 to 70 years, the motor of our core economy has shifted in profound ways. And that motor has shifted from being an economy that was uh, an industrial economy to one that is predominantly a human economy. Put a different way, the motor of an industrial economy is a motor of essentially um, de-skilling labor, of commoditizing labor. The motor of a human economy is one that's based on skills. But we don't have measurements for productivity in a human economy. Um, think about like how do I determine who's the more productive software engineer is it the person who wrote more lines of code right that would be a very industrial definition of productivity how many widgets does somebody produce how much revenue does the salesperson uh, generate um uh, how many minutes does it take uh, a, a call center worker to work through a, a phone call um but none of those applies to the software developer in fact the software developer who's writing more lines of code maybe is likely uh, generating less efficient, less elegant code than somebody who's uh, being more streamlined, more sparse. Um, and so I think what underlies the question is that not only don't we have the metrics, but the metrics that we have are focused on the wrong part of the equation. You see, productivity is a ratio, as you can see in the screen, of the uh, value of the output to the cost of, of labor input. And whenever we think about productivity, whenever we try to measure productivity today, our mental model is about the denominator in this equation. How do I make um, the cost of the input lower? How do I trade uh, to lower cost labor sources? How do I use automation to replace wet labor? How do I do time and motion studies to get people to go faster and therefore re reduce the, the amount of input that I require? But we seldom think about the numerator. How do I make the value of human endeavor worth more? And how do I invest in human endeavor to make it worth more? And so that's been a, a big focus of, of our work, is trying to think about what makes people worth more. Well, one fairly straightforward answer to it is, um, when you have people who are better skilled, um, who are more knowledgeable, they're able to do better work. And so we've been spending time thinking about how you define the skills that seem to be um, uh, generating the most lift in uh, worker productivity. Um, here's just an example from the software industry, and we're going to come back to this in, in actually somewhat different context in a few minutes. Um, but where we define certain sets of skills, which we call on the frontiers, these are skills which um, have um, the greatest value in the market, um, and what you're seeing here on on the y-axis is an indexed value, so it's relative uh, a relative value measure. Um, so when somebody acquires one of these skills, how much does her, um, her worth as a worker go up? Um, we sort of make a basic assumption around market efficiency. And then the other axis, we're looking at how fast they're growing. Um, and so these are some of the skills that are out in the frontiers. They don't yet define a lot of roles, but they are 
um, uh, on the frontiers of those roles. And so you can start to see sets of skills which are critical to defining you know, where the outsized value is um, in a given field, in this case here, software development. Right. So then what you can do is start to refract that value more clearly. You see, how people use skills is different in different contexts. Um, and so we need to be able to understand and differentiate between the skills that um, boost a worker's market value from those that are um, growing the fastest, um, from those that um, you know, are, are out in the margins, but, but really seem to be most disruptive from the ones that um, are foundational to a role um, to the ones that um, are adding the most versatility to a role and so forth. And, and you can sort of see that bear out here with a very straightforward job, a very workaday job, a distribution manager. And, you know, what are the sets of skills that, uh, uh, that she needs and how do they work in different ways? Because once we understand that, we can understand where is the opportunity greatest to invest. I want to play that out here um, in a two-part framework. This is something that we originally developed together with um, a partner um, uh, who, a uh, global tech company, who had a, uh, a really interesting uh, uh, question. They said, you know, our workforce is um, is pretty large, um, and we're generating an even larger amount of revenue. So you know we're we're happy with with our financial performance. But how do we make sure that when we double our size, we're not doubling our workforce? We're a software company. It should be increasing returns to scale. And yet our the growth of our workforce has actually historically been linear. And so it raised some of these questions of how would they invest again, not, how do they shrink? How do they reduce the cost of the labor? But how would they invest to make their workforce more productive to change the shape of that arc? We thought about two fundamental questions. One, what are the roles where there's the most potential for productivity increase? And two, what are the specific ways of reprioritizing and uh, activities and investing in new sets of skills that increase that? And I'll talk about these two frameworks um, in a minute and how they sort of um, nest into each other, like Matryoshki or whatever, which uh, um, uh, you can kind of take apart. Uh, so let's start with this question of how you would identify roles. So here um, you're seeing. Um, we looked at two sets of dimensions. Um, one is uh, performance variability. And the other is um, what I'll call output um, intangibility or immeasurableness. Um, so here's why it sounds like, hey, pretty abstruse ideas, but, but let me tell you what I mean. Um, Performance variability is this. There's some roles where there's actually good performance is a ceiling. And there are other roles where good performance is a floor. If you're a fry chef at McDonald's, good performance is a ceiling. You may be an outstanding worker, but the best thing you can aspire to do is not burn the fries. Um, there's not scope for outperformance. There's a lot of other roles um, where the good performance is a floor. We, we're hiring people, we assume that they're gonna be decent, but, but there's a big range between um, a typical software engineer, for example, or a typical data scientist and somebody who's really excellent, between a typical salesperson and somebody who's really excellent. The other dimension we look at here is how intangible is the output. Um, so there's some sets of things where we can still count it pretty easily. The salespeople are a good example of that. I can still measure fairly simply, um, you know, kind of how much somebody sells or, or what have you. And there's some places where we actually can't measure it at all. Those places, you know, look, the, the, uh, the McDonald's fry shops or, or whatever, the ones at the bottom left, 
those kinds of roles are places that are ripe for even pre-generative AI automation. Um, right, these are our task-based roles. The task can be automated. Um, you have other sets of roles where you can, what we say systematize and enhance, right? This is top left, right? We can look at what defines, what are the behaviors of the really great salesperson? And we can try to teach them to somebody who's less great. But the roles where we don't know how to define it, um, and so we don't know how to measure it, but we know we know that there's a big difference. Um, the proverbial, I, I'll know it when I see it. Those are places where what defines the difference is skill. And so that says, hey, here's places where if we're trying to build productivity, those are places where we need to focus. So then you can start to say, okay, what are the skills that drive that transformation within a role? Here's an example of a, of a business development manager. Um, one of the roles that I think we had um, featured before, and and then say, okay, what are what are sets of roles which are um, which are growing fast within that? What are sets of roles that not only are growing fast but have high levels of of market value within the role? Um, and that so a business development manager who knows demand gen um, or who has complex problem solving skills and somewhat those are sets of places where it seems that you can significantly increase the level of productivity that somebody has. Um, you can then start to say, okay, well, where, where does a given company have its current strength? So um, here's an example of a company that has 4,000 software developers um, across some of the sets of skill clusters that seem to add the greatest value. Um, what's their prevalence? of people with those sets of capabilities. Well, as you can see here, um, not tons. Um, and so it starts to identify, hey, these are places where we can invest. It also becomes a measure because it becomes a way of saying, okay, in any given function, there are sets of skills that define the future, the sets of skills that are growing fastest, that are hardest to fill, that are delivering the greatest value. And so you can find that basket and then say, how prevalent are they? How prevalent are they in our, our uh, in in the job specifications that represent the future of what we expect our workforce to be? How prevalent are they in um, in our existing workforce? And we can do things like mine their LinkedIn profiles or whatever, and um, you can start to evaluate the level of future readiness um, and, and how optimized those workforces are for the future. Um, ultimately, you can get quite granular with this. Um, this is an example from an organization where you say, okay, look, let's take a look at there's certain sets of roles where um, we can see a strong alignment, right? You know, our, our, um, by those kind of core productivity measures of, you know, uh, those skill readiness measures or, you know, how, what extent are people in a various part of our uh, workforce um, invested with the sets of skills that should make them optimally productive? Um, optimally innovative, and how innovative, how optimized are we relative to our peers? So you can see some sets of places where this firm um, was either moderately aligned or, or you know, highly aligned and ahead of its peers. But there are many more roles where their peers were more aligned than they, um, and a few where there seemed to be basic symmetry um, between them and, and peers, and so. You can then say, okay, look, these are places where we could be at significant competitive disadvantage unless we start to be able to invest more significantly. And so it's a different way of measuring readiness. It's one that's less around a numeric calculus and one around a skill calculus, but which nonetheless um, lends itself being able to say, how do we make uh, how do we reprioritize our activities? How do we reprioritize our investments? Um, and this is sort of a, a basic conceptual framework of just saying, just like with anything else, right? Um, what are the most valuable things that we do in any given role? And what are the things we're spending time on? Um, I wish that, and, and by the way, it's it's a good exercise for all of us to do in all in our lives in general, right? What are the things I'm doing that are highest value? What are the things I'm spending the most time on? 
Um, we'd all like to say that we're prioritizing our time toward the things that are highest value. Usually it's not the case and it's certainly not the case at work. Um, how do we in a more conscious and conscientious way be able to uh, undertake that or in a more analytical way uh, that evaluation and say, you're in the case of a software developer uh, for this for a given firm, you know, where were those software developers spending their time? What were the kinds of things that they could do that would would make them more effective over time? So I want to abstract this idea, um, this I this kind of measurement, which we've talked about thus far as uh, measuring the uh, the the kind of capability of a workforce within a firm and think about it in a more macroeconomic way. To think about how it defines the, the workforce of a region or a city or a, or a nation. Um, so let's talk about Boston. Um, I spent a lot of years um, running a company based in Boston. Um, love the city, care about it. Um, and so recently did some work um, together with an organization, um, an economic development organization in Boston to understand um, its software talent ecosystem. Now, on the surface of it, um, Boston seems to, or Massachusetts more broadly, seems to be, um, you know, you know, really in a very good place. Um, you've got um, just a seventh uh, highest concentration of, of software developers of any state, and that includes some, some very big states like um, New York and California and Virginia and Texas. Um, which are dramatically larger in population. It's um, got high salaries. It's um, highest, third highest share of employment of software. Uh, software is the third highest share of, of employment of any state. All that says, well, this is great. Um, but here's um, here's the problem. Uh, all is not well under the surface. You can see here when you look at questions of growth. Um, you know, there's uh, a uh, you know, there, there's a lot of places that are eclipsing the city. And here's where it gets even more disturbing. And that's when you actually look at skills and what skills are represented in the Massachusetts um, work, uh, software workforce. Um, if you look at measurements of, um, of skill readiness, um, of uh, and this is across all tech jobs. This includes biotech, which actually is quite advanced, um, and some other tech sectors. Um, you know, Massachusetts starts to fall. Um, when you start to look explicitly at software skills and explicitly at the presence of the prevalence of those frontier skills that we were talking about before, the ones that are going to define the future of a workforce that are most disruptive, Boston ranks number twenty-two rash nationally. So. That same idea of a metric of future readiness, the same idea of uh, a metric of skill-driven productivity can be used to measure not only companies, not only, uh, but also um, cities, nations, sectors, and becomes a, a really important barometer for telling us when we're starting to be eclipsed when the workforce that we have may no longer be the workforce that we need. So one of the core ways that we can build uh, value into workforce is through worker mobility. And uh, this is something which is really important because most companies actually don't measure the mobility of their workers. They might sometimes measure internal promotion rates. Some companies do that. Um, but uh, even that turns out to actually be quite a complex set of questions, right? Are you measuring across all employees? Are you looking at starting cohorts and what percentage of them get uh, measured? I know we've got a bunch of, um, of fellow data nerds on this call. I'll, I'll try not to get too down into the weeds, but, um, but this is uh, some work that we've been spending quite a bit of time looking at. Um, and more broadly, um, how do we think about um, how we make sure that the value of our workforce, the value of our human capital stock is increasing over time. Um, and so that's why developing measures of mobility are so important. It's also so important at a societal level. 
if you were born in the 1940s, you had over a 90% chance that you were going to be doing better than your parents. If you were born in 1984, um, it was at best even odds. And so overall, I think there, a lot of us have deep anxiety about the continued vitality of the American dream. Um, that American dream is not only core to our social fabric, it's also core to our economic fabric. Um, it's core to what's driven our economy. It's core to a thesis of economic growth. It's core to the notion of what will make companies worth more over time. Put a different way, if your workforce isn't rising, it's very hard for a company to rise. Um, you can't win a game if half your talent is on the bench, um, if people aren't being played effectively in, in the field. Um, and so we set out to measure this. Um, we created something which we launched this past fall called the American Opportunity Index. Um, and it's essentially a measurement of the Fortune 250 based upon the mobility um, and more broadly uh, the opportunity experience of millions of their workers. Um, it grew out of some work that we did. Um, this is, and this is work, by the way, that we undertook together with um, Schultz Family Foundation and with, uh, with Joe Fuller at, at Harvard Business School's project on managing the future of, uh, uh, of work. Um, we, this grew out of some work that Joe and I had done in the past, looking at how people rise out of poverty trap jobs. And we looked at a bunch of ways that people either escape poverty or don't, um, whether they change jobs, whether they change sectors, what job they start in. And there were a number of factors that mattered, but one of the ones that seemed to have the biggest impact was what company you work for. And you could have two workers in the exact same role at direct competitors who'd have entirely different prospects for upward mobility. And it said to us that this, that companies have more agency, more responsibility than they think for whether uh, people rise. And again, for that question of whether the American dream continues to be vital. So we decided to measure this um, and to rank companies on this basis and to do it not by looking at inputs, um, whether a company offers certain kinds of benefits, um, whether it's um, providing certain kinds of support or structures for coaching to its uh, to their workers, but to focus instead on on outcomes. It's not that we don't think that the inputs are important. We think they're terribly important. But we wanted to be able to evaluate which ones matter. And I think that's a critical um, measurement for all human capital analytics professionals to be able to, to do is to be able to apply this, to be able to say, okay, what actually works in making sure that people rise? What actually works into making sure in making sure that um, the company's human capital stock is becoming more important? Um, and so we tracked the careers of 3 million um, U.S. workers um, working in roles that don't require a college degree um, at Fortune 250 companies in 2017. And we looked at what happened to their careers over the course of five years. Now, mobility is one of those things that, as I said before, sounds uh, somewhat, uh, you know, sounds straightforward. It's not straightforward. Um, and you know, when you start to try to measure it, we broke it. We realized we're going to need to, to break uh, this whole question of opportunity creation down into three components, uh, access to opportunity. So can you get on the ladder? Um, uh, mobility, once you're on the ladder, do you climb and, and pay? Um, how much do you make enough to stay on the ladder? But even those metrics are, are terribly broad. And so we started to create a set of, uh, of underlying metrics. Access, right, is for any given role, is a company more or less likely to hire somebody without a degree? Are they more or less likely to hire somebody without a lot of work experience? Um, on mobility, um, how how fast you get your promotion, how far you rise, um, uh, whether when you leave, uh, you get, uh, uh, you tend to leave and then step into a better job. Um, do you stay long enough for it to any of it to matter? These are all very different metrics um, and all very important to, to bring together. Um, and of course, wages as well. 
For that reason, by the way, one of the things that we found, we put it all together in a blender and we, we surveyed 500 workers to find out which factors they valued more so we could weight the model effectively as long as, as well as we surveyed a um, number of, of experts in this field. Um, when we put it together in a blender, we found uh, that a lot of the distinctions that each of those measures um, uh, represents got obscured. Um, you know, some of the companies that have the, the strongest reputations as being great places to work, um, that have cultish followings uh, of employer of employees where people tend to stay throughout their whole careers, actually didn't do so well. Um, and so we looked at it and we realized that here's what was going on, right? So there's, uh, let's take this measure here, which is called career stability. We started realizing that, that we needed to actually break this out into different archetypes of opportunity creation. That company that's doing really well for its workers, it's a great place to work, and that no one ever leaves. Well, if no one ever leaves, um, no one ever actually gets promoted. Um, that's just a basic fact of life, unless the company is growing crazy fast. Imagine like what the world would look like if no one ever retired, right? Young, young people would never have a chance to step into better jobs. Um, and so that doesn't mean those are bad companies. Um, and in fact, for a lot of people we, we surveyed, they weren't looking for really fast pace of upward mobility. They wanted to be able to come to work, get do good work, get treated well, enjoy the people they were working with, get paid well, and go home. And for those kinds of workers, career stability may be a perfectly valid form of career. Of, of, that's very different from companies that bring people in and move them up fast, different from other companies that actually don't have a lot of opportunity to move up, but seem to train people really well so that when they leave, um, they're getting uh, hired into much better jobs. Overall, these metrics that we created proved to matter and matter a great deal. So um, you can see some of the, the key differences between um, employers in the top quintile in each measure and employers in the bottom quintile in each measure. So um, on an access perspective, companies that um, are um, top quintile are four times more likely to hire somebody who's had a lot of work experience, 25% more likely to take, uh, uh, um, to take a bet on somebody without, um, uh, without um, a degree. Um, people are moving up. They're getting each promotion a year faster. They're moving. Uh, they're moving three times further in their career. Um, they're staying to twice as long. And by the way, while we undertook these analyses, looking mostly from a worker perspective, think about that from an employer perspective. The time when a lot of employers are really struggling for talent and to retain talent, realizing that the difference between top and bottom, bottom quintile companies in any given sector. Um, and we controlled for sectors and, and occupations, right? Is literally a 2x difference. Wow. You've got much more opportunity to control your destiny than you think. Um, pay was another one, which um, was an astounding difference. And that's why I sort of saved that one for last. Um, in any given occupation, we found that um, the difference between top and bottom quintile um, employers um, in terms of pay was often more than uh, uh, more than twofold. Um, an, an admin in a top quintile employer makes eighty-two thousand dollars a year, and a bottom quintile employer makes thirty-four thousand. Right, so that difference as to where you work is a difference that bears out to the tune of about one point two million dollars over the course of a thirty-year career. Um, not based on what work you're doing. But based on where you choose to work. And yet today, you know, we have a nutrition label uh, on the back of every can. We've got consumer disclosures in every loan you take out. We don't have a nutrition label for jobs. Um, and so these measurements, which are very important for companies to be able to understand how their human capital value stock is rising, are also going to be incredibly important for, for workers to be able to make better informed decisions and to have better informed conversations with their managers. Um, that was especially true because we also use these measures to look not only at those positive archetypes I was describing before, you know, what are the companies that provide good career stability, what are the good companies that, that provide launch pads for your career and so forth, but also ones where um, there were patterns of underperformance. Um, turns out Tolstoy was wrong. Um, he famously said that, that um, uh, happy families are all alike, but unhappy families are 
um, all look, um, you know, all, all look different. All have their uh, different reasons for being unhappy. I, I'm trying not to crowd, just to mince his words too often, um, though. On a, and then that's a wonderful book. But um, you know, here we actually found that there are very clear patterns of unhappiness, so to speak. So unhappy companies actually um, do often look a lot alike. Um, and in some cases, there were things like, hey, places that were where they actually were promoting people pretty fast, um, but weren't doing any training and people flamed out. Um, places where uh, they were uh, doing a great job on access measures, but uh, people don't have a way of moving up. Um, but we also found a range of places that um, where we saw significant disparities. Um, you know, there were places where a lot of companies where uh, workers in, in professional jobs do very well, but uh, people who aren't working professional level roles um, get stuck. Uh, we saw companies with wonderful brands that um, uh, where, employ where workers might look at that and say, hey, wow, this must be a great company. And actually their company, their employees do very poorly. Um, so we looked at a range of different metrics and it matters quite a bit. And it matters that you be able to, um, therefore, as a company, track this, not just at the level of your whole workforce, but precisely because of those kinds of disparities to be able to see them bear out function by function. And as you can see here, looking at a bunch of um, Fortune 100 telcos, ISPs, you can see some very significant differences across um, functions in their organizations. So I want to talk about, um, finish by talking about another measure of disparity, um, and that is around workforce equity. Um, today, we have seen, I want to talk about two aspects of, um, of workforce equity, one around how we measure uh, representation in the workforce, and the second, how we measure inclusivity in the workforce. Um, right now, companies probably through a census uh, uh, can hopefully be able to look at their, uh, their representation by function. Um, we're always surprised at how unfortunately seldom that is done to be able to look across functions. But one of the problems that companies have is they don't know how to benchmark it. Um, they don't know what good actually is. A lot of companies are, are working with real sincerity on this issue. Um, and they'll say, hey, look at our objective is for each of our functions to represent the America that, um, that we serve. That's the right ambition. It's a good ambition and, and it's the right target. But if let's say, let's talk about actuaries as an example. And there's a not so fun fact for you. Actuaries are the whitest occupation in America. Only 4% of actuaries are um, black or, or Hispanic. Um, followed just behind by veterinarians, by the way. Um, if you're trying to, um, uh, you, know, kind of, you know, if your aspiration is that, that they should represent the America they serve, then it shouldn't be 4%, it should be 40%. That's gonna take a few steps. And in the meantime, though, um, how do you know, you know, it's easy to sort of write yourself a hall pass and say, okay, well, you know, it's actuaries, it's just hard, right? But what, what, what if you could actually start to measure and estimate the representation of people at, um, in that role at peer firms? Um, and one of the kinds of things that we've been working on. Um, that, and, and in a named competitor way, be able to say, hey, look, first of all, what is, you know, the distribution of, um, of our, um, our representation, as you can see on the left. Um, this is an example from a, uh, our estimates um, uh, from outside in data, um, looking at a Fortune 50 retailer um, and a number of their professional jobs where despite being almost 50% uh, uh, Black or Hispanic firm-wide, actually many of their most valuable jobs are, are dramatically less. But then how do you benchmark that? Um, so let's take example of their software developers and engineers, again, 4% on the left. Um, but you can see that there are other uh, uh, firms 
with dramatically greater representation. When you can see that, you can realize that you can be better than you are. And a lot of the excuses that you've been writing yourself, hey, we can't, you know, it's, it's just really hard to find diverse software engineers. Uh -uh. There are other firms that are doing better than you. There are other firms that are doing better than you than in that sector. There's other firms that are doing better than you in your location. Um, and you can start to create more effective benchmarks and through those more effective benchmarks, better targets. Um, and from there to be able to see significant disparities. And that's where we get to questions of um, not just representation, but inclusivity. You see, we talked before about how to measure things like retention. Um, and, and don't get me started on that question or how to measure even harder things like mobility. Right now, the way inclusivity gets measured is through, uh, is through survey-based instrument, very low response rates. Um, and so as a result, it's also kind of questionable what do those response rates mean when, uh, how, do you, how, do you, um, how do you interpret it? But if I can see that there are some groups that are leaving before others, there's some groups that are more likely to get promoted than others. I definitionally have an inclusivity problem. And then I can deploy a, a, um, a, um, a sentiment survey to be able to understand what specifically workers are experiencing. Um, I know more specifically which sort of workers I need to focus on. I know more specifically what I need to ask them about. But the ability to create metrics that give us um, de facto views of inclusivity through disparities in in, in, in uh, retention, disparities in, um, in, uh, in mobility are extremely powerful. Ultimately, that will lead um, to the ability to see diversity as not just a zero sum game. Remember we were saying before, a lot of firms will say, well, gee, I'm hiring for those actuaries. Um, you know, what are we to do? Well, when you start to say, hey, look, maybe I can find talent pools that don't have, um, that, that have many of the right skills, but aren't currently working in this field. We can start to unlock reservoirs of diversity that we haven't been seeing to date. We haven't seen as um, comparable talent. And so that ability to create new measures of uh, and more granular measures of, of representation and inclusivity ties together with the ability to measure skills because it's through that that we can see the ability to bridge the gap to see a wider potential pool of talent um, and to create a more equitable workforce um, I'd love to take questions. Um, uh, on, um, I'll turn over to you. I'll just put my email here for a minute and my LinkedIn in case anyone wants to reach out to me directly. But thank um, you, so, thank you, thank you, thank you so, Rich. And uh, we just have um, a few minutes for the questions. Uh, the first question came from Aaron Prince, who is graduating uh, the, in a couple of weeks, and it's about your, yeah skills. Compass Report 2023. One of the topics um, is how long a skill will hold its value for the company. Yeah. And so Aaron is asking, uh, can you speak to this? Yeah, great question. Um, and that was one where, um, so first of all, just for, for the broader group, I'll, I'll explain what that skill compass report was. Uh, or is actually, and uh, encourage you to to look it up. I think it it's uh, available on the Burning Glass Institute dot org uh, website under research. Uh, it's something we did in partnership with Coursera. You can also find it on the Coursera website. Um, so, uh, you know, here's the the question we were trying to answer there, and then I'll I'll talk to specifically to Aaron's question around like how do we measure some of these things. Um, what we want to do is to create a more effective framework for making better optimized decisions about which skills to invest in. Um, this is a, a big problem that chief learning officers in particular um, uh, are confronted with, but also workers um, themselves. Um, you know, we know that uh, 
uh, you know, it's it's there's a large universe of of skills, large universe of content, uh, hard to know how to make effective decisions, and so we dimensionalize that space in um, in three ways. Uh, one, how much value? And so we were talking about earlier about the sort of skill value measure. Um, you know, kind of how much of a boost um, does a skill provide to somebody's earnings? Two, how long does it take to learn? And three, um, how uh, how enduring is that measure? Uh, is that skill? Um, that's uh, creates a very rich space from an optimization perspective. It's funny when we first shared with some people that we were creating this uh, this dimensionalization. Um, you know, I, I always got asked this the question of, okay, well, well, what are the skills? First of all, I got asked the point, what do you mean, what are the skills? I said, well, you know, what are the skills that are really quick to uh, acquire that uh, pack a big punch and and that are are long enduring? I say, guys, there's no free lunch. There's precisely zero skills that are that are you know tops on on all of those dimensions. Um, and that's exactly why you need a a more effective framework. Be able to say, okay, look, there's some sets of skills that you acquire because they are worth the slog. Um, they're gonna take a long time, um, but you'll get a lot of value out of them and that will endure over the course of your career. There's some sets of skills that are a quick fix. Um, you know, there's some sets of skills that are hard and may not last that long, but they provide a um a, a really, you know, a, quite a bit of value. Right. Being able to understand those dynamics is uh you know a uh, key to being able to um, make smarter decisions either as a learner or as as an employer um each of those dimensions sounds simple and I, none of them what um you know i'll give you an example on the time to learn um and this is one you know i mentioned we partnered with coursera in this work when we first started out we just said okay well let's look at the the length of the, of the course and that will be a um, uh, uh, you know, that, that we just looking at how, what's the, the number of hours it takes to, to master a skill. But you wind up with some really wonky um, answers there. Like, you know, you find some advanced AI, AI skills that um, seem to be really quick to learn. Well, they're quick to learn if you're already an advanced software engineer, perhaps. Um, but it would be very deceptive to say that those sets of skills are are, uh, are are quick to learn. And so, you know, we had to to do there was to actually look at more measures of skill adjacency, um, which could complement those time-based measures. Um, same thing on skill value, where you know you want to look both at sort of how much of a market boost something gives, but also um, its its growth and the like. Um, from a skill durability measure. We looked at both historical uh, patterns and we looked at future projection um, to be able to help us inform, um, you know, whether we felt a skill was the kind of skill that has a very short half life, or whether it's got a broader um, and and more enduring uh, life to it. Um, you know, I'm trying to squeeze in as many uh, questions as I can. Um, so, uh, Melissa Fisher, who is a faculty member here, is asking about uh, the kind of the role, I paraphrase, the role of education vis-a-vis -vis skills building. You're a big advocate of measuring skills. And once we have those more precise measures and know the value of, of a particular skill, where does the education, and again, I mentioned your educational uh, you know, background, where does that fit in? What's the role of education? And, and will there be a way to run our economy without people having to get traditional um, university degrees? Um, so I, I want to answer this question from, from two vantage points or two bodies of work that, that we're engaged in right now. Um, so, you know, first I'll say point blank that we we need to be able to construct um, mechanisms that enable people to learn on the fly. Um, and some of those will be digital in nature. Some of them will look like the School of Professional Studies at NYU, and some of them will will look like um, instead of degreed programs at like at certificate programs and the like. Um, I want to address on the one hand the need to be able to create 
the, the question of how we create effective credentials um, and the other on what does this mean for degrees? So in terms of how we create credentials, um, let's, uh, you know, we've recently partnered together with a Boston-based nonprofit called Jobs for the Future to um, relaunch um, a framework, an operating framework for evaluating short-term credentials um, based upon the outcomes that, there, that, that workers and learners experience. The problem with um, traditional, with, with the credential space as it operates today, is there's not that there's too few credentials. Um, the US Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, has something called the Credential Engine Project, which catalogs in like 1.2 million credentials. Just wanna just put that in context. The Oxford English Dictionary has 114,000 words in it. So there's literally 10 times more credentials than there are words in the English language. Um, right? We don't actually need more credentials, but we need more credentials with currency because 90% of all jobs that ask for a certification ask for one of the top 200 out of 1.2 million. So the question is then, if we're gonna have a skills-driven marketplace, employers need some ability to evaluate which skills, act, which credentials work for representing those skills. Um, and so I think, you know, we're, we're excited to look at questions of outcomes to be able to create more effective, more comprehensive measures of quality, which I think is gonna be a key underpinning. There's the other part of this though, is what's the value of a degree in a degree optional world? Um, and uh, Jeff Salingo, um, former managing editor of the, the Chronicle of the Higher Education, and I recently uh, wrote a uh, working paper on this, um, which you can also find on our, on our website. Um, you know, we found overall is that degrees are still, um, you know, the value of, of a degree is still strong. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the reports of the, the, the death of, of degrees are, are highly exaggerated. Um, that said, we also know that degrees, um, as they're currently packaged, um, are facing increasing skepticism, both from employers who are increasingly dropping degree requirements and from learners and workers who increasingly um, are doubting whether they need a degree. Um, there's been a generational change in perceptions of the value of higher education just in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, Gallup uh, in a Gallup survey found that, that, I think it's an every five year survey or something like that, found that um, 70 some odd percent of, of Americans said that it was very important to get a college degree. Um, when they last did this, I think it was down in you know, only about 40 some odd percent of people who think it's very important to get a college degree. So what that says is that we need to focus on making a degree not a, a both and proposition, both about the core fundamentals, the core liberal arts heritage that's always made um, a, uh, a college degree or a graduate degree a great privilege. Um, and a great benefit, but also about the kind of work ready skills that are increasingly necessary. We know that in any given degree program, there are certain sets of skills that significantly advance students. We need to make sure that that every student has access to those. Fantastic. You know, we have so many, and you and I were talking about uh, starting the conversation on AI and automation. I think we need to bring you back in the fall. Uh, Matt. Well, I'll look forward to it. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who attended this meeting. We have one more announcement really, really quickly. Uh, if you want to continue this conversation about intersection of technology and learning, uh, June 16th is our big um, annual um, coaching and technology summit, where we are going to be diving in and the specifics of coaching in the time of AI and um, platforms coming in, um, helping us learn. Thank you all and uh, have a great graduation for those of, of my students who are on the call and uh, we'll see you in the fall. Thank you.